nine years of five past seven. Yes. Right, yeah, and that's for you, please, isn't it? How do other people think about being silent? Just for even just 10, 20 seconds. I was worried that Eric was going to knock off me dessert. Ah. <laughs> okay, so you had worries? <laughs> if that was genuine? <laughs> what do other people think about being silent? Uh, very unusual, but younger kids. Yes, you don't think that's fair. Yeah. Any, any other comments? About just being silent, just for 10 seconds. Wasted space. Wasted space, okay. Because you feel you should be doing something. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's great. Thank you. Thank you for doing that and thanks for sharing your thoughts there. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life story. Because as was said in the introduction, I was actually trained as an economist. But prior to that even, I worked as a secretary actually for in 400 companies. So I've seen, I've seen a lot of industrial settings. Then I trained as an economist, so I understood how those industrial settings worked. And then I had the dream in 1998 that I was teaching a piece, and it completely changed everything for me in just about every aspect of my life. I actually, uh, all my income supports, in a sense, were pulled away, and I started to really explore what peace was in my own life. Now what happened was, I was living in uh, Canberra, and I ended up moving down to Melbourne. And it just so happened I was five minutes from La Trobe University. Now, I just decided to go and have a bit of a, uh, a look down at La Trobe. And I also got on the computer and I was thinking, well, what do I really want to do? What do I want to do, darling? And the only thing I could think of was peace. That was it. So I Googled peace and I found Helen Caldicott. Does anybody remember Helen Caldicott in the room? Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately. <laughs> well, I fortunately got to meet Helen. I, um, I, I actually saw her on ABC and I had a, a feeling about her. So I, I want to emphasize intuition. If you're following your own thread in this life, it's very important to follow intuition because it does lead you to where you need to go. Now with Helen Holcott, I didn't know who she was and I just decided to contact her on the email and I just told her uh, a little bit about myself and for some reason she sent me her telephone number and I ended up deciding to ring her and on a gut feeling, I chose to drive 2,000 kilometres, you know, on credit, with that money, <laughs> to go and visit her. And she allowed that. So we sat down, we talked. It was very interesting. She made me read her books so that I'd come informed. <laughs> and it turns out that this woman's got a, a very deep knowledge of the industrial and military complex. Now, what was interesting about our meeting was she knew I was a clown. And uh, she then very excitedly went into her, you know, into her drawers and said... I, I met Pat Adams, and she said that she was clowning, well not really clowning, but they were doing a protest march in New York called The Naked Truth. And I thought, I thought, but you'd have to be very brave, wouldn't you, to be famous <laughs> and go naked down the street. <laughs> to me, that's courage. <laughs> but that's exactly what they did, and what they were trying to do was to raise awareness, you know, about peace. So when I, when I sat with her, she encouraged me to go back to Melbourne and enrol at La Trobe University where there was a peace studies course. And I knew at the time there was no career path in this, so it was a stepping out into something that I, knew, I didn't think I could make money from, and I was correct, because it isn't a money-making business. It's, it's, really, it's really about raising awareness <coughs> for work. It's a, an enormous joy, though, I can tell you, um, and I'll, I'll sort of explain what happened from there. So I went to La Trobe University and I studied away. I decided to dress as a peace clown and go up to people. Just, just grab some more things. Up to I went up to people. Oh, sorry, I'm <laughs> Just sort of connect. Just. I keep hugging you. I don't know why you're very hungry. He's single. He's single. Oh, it doesn't matter whether they're single or not. I don't actually mind. <laughs> so I went up to people at La Trobe and I asked them what, what they thought about peace in themselves and peace in the world. It was very interesting because they're not used to having a clown walking around the campus. But people um, gave me their comments and I wrote them all down. I also did a toilet paper poll where I said, uh, I, I put up a sign in the, in the loo <laughs> and I said to people, this is the place where you go for peace, right? <laughs> Tell me what you think. So I ended up compiling a lot of information believe it or not, from graffiti in the toilet <laughs> as well. But at the end of the day, I sort of, I, I laughingly said to myself, um, I'm a world peace clown, was what I felt. And I thought, who in the world is a world peace clown? And, and I want to emphasise here about following the thread. 
You know, many of us get very locked into, you know, it, doing this and then this and then this. But I, I tend to work off a lot of inspiration. So if I feel to, to you know, investigate who else is a world of peace clown, I'm just going to Google it. So I go, Google's been so, let me tell you how great Google is. <laughs> so I Googled it and, you, and I found Dr. Patch Adams. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll write to Patch, you know, and I'm just going to massage a few people while I'm talking. You don't mind me Oh, I love it. Do you love it? <laughs> Good, I'm very happy. <laughs> So I, I Googled for Patch Adams, and then I'm just jumping across. I hope you don't mind if I just want to go across. Oh, right. I do. Darling, you're going to be upset. I am. Don't cry. No. <laughs> Please don't. Anyway, so I ended up writing to Patch Adams, and to my surprise, he actually wrote back. And his brother rang me from Washington, and his brother said, um, he said, we'd like to invite you to Russia with us. And at the time, it seemed to me absolutely impossible that I could go to Russia with Patch. We're talking five weeks until his clown trip. He does healing through humour tours. He's been doing it for 18 years. And he's done it as his way of, if you like, melting the Cold War. He started off when the, the Russian-US conflict was, was happening uh, with the nuclear standoff. So that was Patch's initiative, which is a very creative initiative to go and bring you know, groups of clowns into Russia, into orphanages and nursing homes and all sorts of places to, to create harmony. Which is what you said, isn't it? <coughs> you said yep. harmony. <coughs> That's what Patch is about. He's a very, very interesting guy. He's very, he, he'd be about 65, 70 now. So he's still doing that. So it's true. Yeah, well, he's all. We'll be. We're going to create a road to be clown club. Yeah, yeah. We're all clowns. That's the idea. I've got more clowns at Rotary than anywhere else, actually. <laughs> So any, as a result of, um, of Patch uh, you know, inviting me to Russia, a woman I'd met once at Canberra Hospital when we were doing some clowning in the hospital offered to, sorry I should get in front so you can see, <laughs> offered to pay seven and a half thousand dollars for me to go to Russia for two weeks. I was wow. offered that. And, and I, was, I cried when, when this person offered me the money who just met me. <coughs> but at the same time I also felt that I was meant to go to Russia. I knew before I got given the money that I was going. And this is a, a, an intuitive feeling that I had, that this is the way I'm going. Um, you couldn't have planned it, it, is the point here. So anyway, I did go to Russia for two weeks, and it was over in Russia that I saw that we can create peace through humour, you know. By just going up to people, you know, and you can turn around, you can turn around, you can turn around. <laughs> He's very strong. See, it, it's, a, it's really about interacting with people. Go on, I'll just find something else to play with. Look <laughs> oh, at listen to the laughter. <laughs> Have you ever seen one of these? It's an IUD. <laughs> <laughs> Can we delete that bit? <laughs> faces on the children <laughs> and at the hospital I'm going <laughs> and the doctors are probably going what the is that <laughs> what the <laughs> anyway In believe Russia. it or not darling it's called um, an orgasmatron <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm told darling it's better than marriage <laughs> can, can take your glasses off before this happens <laughs> his, hair, his hair may go curly no, so. he, he might break his glasses oh. you like that <laughs> oh, I wish we had audio. Bernie <laughs> <laughs> sounds like he's got a lot of experience in this orgasmatron stuff. I'm just giving you neurons. He must be a cat. Good job, isn't it? It kills lice. <laughs> yes. Darling, what did you mean? So, yes, um, so the clowning is fantastic for connecting with people in a way that's just human to human contact. And that's what I noticed when we were in Russia. We were, we were able to, to connect with the children and in the nursing homes, the old people, and it, it just creating a lot of joy. And Patch would get up and he'd dance with people. And it, I tell you, it was really, it was wonderful. And you don't need alcohol. This is what I, I think you all need to hear this. <laughs> you don't actually need alcohol. Have no, fun. No, 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 no. <laughs> I know it's really I know it's Oh, well. I don't actually need it. That's for fun. <laughs> but good point, good point. Yeah, so anyway, after Russia, I came back to Australia and I started to get inspired about writing a peace, non violence, and anti bullying program for kids. Because one of my intentions was I really wanted to create something that was going to be effective 
not just a feel good thing where we just go running around the classroom, but actually creating um, a peace education program that was uh, really uh, evoking, if you like, of peaceful behaviours. So I, I wrote over a year a Real Hope program, which is an acronym for Responsibility, Empathy, Awareness, Love, Honesty, Oneness, Peace, Enjoyment and Service. Now with these values, I, I taught them in a way where children were um, firstly critically thinking. So I was asking them, what's responsibility? What does it mean? Why do we do it? You know, and the kids would give me their answers, so I write it up on the board. Now the reason I teach in such a way is that the wisdom is inherent within every person. People do actually have a lot of answers, and quite often, even in this sort of situation where I'm imparting my knowledge to you, I would much rather have a scenario where you're telling me what you think, because I know you know a lot of stuff as well. <coughs> and collectively, when we start to really um, work on <coughs> peace as a real thing, not as this ideal or this negotiated settlement in the Middle East, but when we actually start to really reflect on what peace means and feels like, it can change everything. So this program that I developed was really to help children to access empathy, what it's like to stand in someone else's shoes. Many conflicts arise because people don't feel for other people. You know, they'll, they'll, I mean, it, who hasn't been blunt at times, you know, where we've just said what we thought, but we haven't actually reflected on how the others been impacted. And what empathy, and we don't get taught this stuff for the most part, but what empathy teaches us is to really become aware of this and you'll find a lot of the bullying issues, and even in international relations, we're seeing bullying played out at the international level between countries. But we use it as the extension of military power. Um, rather than sitting down and really working out our differences in a peaceful way where we really want to resolve underlying conflict, not just surface stuff, which is, which is why a lot of the conflicts have never been resolved, is because we haven't really dealt with what's going on for people and how hurt they feel. So it's the emotional stuff, most people go, oh, I don't want to deal with that. Until you do deal with it, it continues. And we are emotional beings, all of us. You know, it's not just in, the, in, in women, it's in men as well. But most, mostly I feel for men because I feel that many of them are taught not to express it. You know, they're, they're actually told to, to pretty much push it down. And I do think violence comes from um, not being able to express what is true for you. So my program, what I've developed here, is a way of getting the kids to go through an experiential program where they actually get to experience their feelings. And I'll just give a couple of examples. Um, there was a really, really interesting educator in the United States back in the 50s called Jane Elliott. And she came up with the Blue Eyed series. Is anybody at all aware of the Blue Eyed series? Yeah. What, what do you recall from it? It's um, segregating people by the colour of their eyes. Yes. And it was based on the Nazi sort of segregation of the Aryan blue-eyed, you know, versus the, the other, if you like. So what she did, she was a very, very clever educator. She divided her class by eye colour. So only blue-eyed kids, you know, were the intelligent ones. And she made sure she praised the blue-eyed kids and all the other kids, brown-eyed or green-eyed, were actually excluded <coughs> and made to feel that they were subordinate. And what, and what they did was um, they did tests on the kids and they found that the kids who felt they were superior did better and the kids that thought they were inferior did obviously a lot worse. But what she did then was change them around and she said, oh, I made a mistake, you know, the blue-eyed, are, it's a recessive gene, you know, the brown eyes are actually superior. And so she went and started to indoctrinate the kids in the reverse. And they found that there was conflicts happening in the playground and again when they did exams, you know, to test intelligence, the kids who had the brown eyes did better than the kids who had blue eyes. So it just shows you the power of suggestion. In, in all, in, in, if we look in our own society, we can see this mirroring out in, in many cases where people have been suggested that they're better or less. We can see that with unemployment, we can see that with management as two extremes. So what I do in my class is I divide the kids by eye colour, but I say only blue eyed kids can be clowns. You know, and I sit them in a circle and we do Chinese whispers. And of course the other kids, they all want to join in because <laughs> they love Chinese whispers. And, and then I just get the teacher to hold the kids back and then we do a debrief. And I say, how did you feel, you know? What did you guys feel? And the blue-eyed kids, they say, oh, we felt special. You know, we felt, we felt better than the other kids. And it all comes out. And then you ask the brown-eyed kids, how did they feel? <coughs> Even though they knew it was a game, they actually felt angry <laughs> and they felt excluded. And then we start a discussion on how can we include people, you know? How do we create 
a situation where everybody's included. So the kids say you can invite them into your game or you know, and, and how would you feel if you were Asian or if you're a girl or a boy, you know, or disabled or what have you. So it's just a, it's a way of, um, through education, helping people to actually experience what it feels like to be segregated. And that's just one example of many in the program. I also teach a little bit about Gandhi's work. I studied Gandhi at La Trobe, and there's a really fantastic film by um, uh, Richard, I think it's David Attenborough, Richard Attenborough, the brother of David. Have people seen the, seen the mm. film Gandhi? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really love this film. It sent shivers up and down my spine when I when I saw it. And uh, anyway, so what I do in my class is um, I actually take a segment out of the film where Gandhi's in South Africa and he's walking with a, a priest. And they're actually walking on the, the boardwalk and in that at that time, anyone that was considered black or you know, a Kaffir or whatever, Cal you know. Sorry? Cal yeah, a coloured person, if they were walking on the boardwalk, they would actually push them off. And in fact, if you saw a British person, you'd have to crawl on the ground at that time. So you can imagine, um, you know, the tension between the coloured and the white people. So what Gandhi did was he just, he just walked on the um, pavement and the pastor was getting very nervous, you know. <laughs> he said, and then Gandhi said, Did, doesn't your Bible say, you know, if you, if you get struck on the left, left cheek, you know, turn to the right? And he goes, oh, I don't think that's literal. <laughs> and so they keep walking, and then these, these South African boys, they end up taking on Gandhi. And they say, get off the pavement, you know, and, you know, we don't want your type around here. And, and anyway, the mother ended up uh, yelling down to her son and telling him to go to school. But Gandhi had a moment in the film where he goes, you'll find there's room for us all. And he just stood there very peacefully, and then these boys went. Now, when I talk to the children, I say, you know, in, in, a, in a normal scenario, we could just, it's easy to hit someone, you know, it's easy to beat someone up. But how brave is it to walk, to keep walking in, standing in your truth? You know, Gandhi chose not to be pushed aside. He chose <coughs> to stand strong in what he felt was, he had a right to walk on the, on the boardwalk. So these are really powerful lessons for children to learn. And, and I know some of the kids in the class who were quite tough kids, they were very challenged by the idea that inner strength is the real strength. They thought strength was here. But I tried to show them that actually it's, it's being peaceful within that's the real strength. The big challenge with creating peace in the world is to reverse the paradigm that strength is not power over someone. It's actually power within yourself. And what that really translates to is choices. We have choices. Now, when you give people choices, it, they, can, they can choose courses of actions for themselves. You know, and the, what we want to really teach young people is non-violent choices. So they don't go beating each other up or, dis, or dissing people, but they actually sit down and they solve the problem. So conflict resolution is extremely important in schools and learning peaceful behaviours. So in this year, Peace Through Service for Rotary, you know, I feel that peace education is one of the most powerful ways in which we can truly make a difference in the world and it really is supporting programs in schools. Now, what I've found as a Peace Scholar is that I haven't had a lot of support, and I'm not necessarily talking about Rotary. I'm talking about actually going into schools and getting schools to actually value peace education. What I've come to understand in recent times, because I've had a marketing training, is that it really needs to be marketed in the world, not as, not as an ideal, but as a reality in curriculum where we teach peaceful behaviours before we get into numeracy and literacy. Because you're not going to create a sustainable world until people feel peace within themselves. And most of us are running our whole lives without spending even a few moments of being still. And it's that stillness that gives you space to reflect. Most children don't spend any time reflecting because they're on the games, you know? So, um, we have a lot of work to do, and I feel I'm truly at the beginning of the work I have to do. But for me, the challenge is to actually getting into schools and getting this on the agenda as important, not as a really nice, like the nice clowns coming into the school. We have to see that peace is important. So I'm just going to uh, say a couple more things. Well, how much time have I got left? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. What I've done personally, whilst I have had uh, struggles getting into schools, is I took myself around the world as a world peace clown at my own expense and I went to 20 countries and I actually took people out on the street with me clowning 
If you go to my website, uh, Clowning Around the World, you'll see there's some footage on all the countries I've been to. I'll just give you an example of them. Um, I went to Bangkok, um, I flew over to India, New Delhi, and I clowned in a shopping centre in New Delhi, I took someone out with me. And I also then uh, flew across to Egypt, and I clowned at a children's exhibition with another Egyptian. Then I flew across to uh, Greece, and then up to London, and I went on the London Underground, and I took, I took some people with me on the London Underground. And the idea was to create peace, you know, on the trains, you know, on the streets, you know, to really connect with different people and to learn to really love strangers, you know, to not be afraid of people. And what I've definitely discovered is that people are great everywhere. And I mean, I don't think Paul Harris was wrong, you know. I do think we're here to make friends. And clowning is one way to really connect in a really beautiful way with people, to see, to get them laughing and not taking life so seriously. Now, after I went to uh, the UK, I went across to the United States in Chicago and I climbed on the streets there. Then I flew to Cancun in Mexico and I made my way down uh, through Mexico right down to Costa Rica. And on the International Day of Peace, I clowned um, at a school that was bilingual. And then from there, I went across to South America. I went to uh, Bolivia, down through Argentina and Chile. And I clown on the streets in all those places as well. And then flew across to New Zealand and back to Australia. And as I did this, I journaled it on my blog. And the idea was is to explore not only peace issues for myself as a person traveling, but also looking at the globalization issue. Uh, the, what I saw was um, the rampant globalization across the planet. And we're seeing in certain cultures, you know, there, a lot of people being dislocated. Internally, they might be tribal societies <coughs> that are having to become capitalized and they're having to learn how to use money. You know, this is, these are uh, craft-based societies. Um, I saw from the sky <coughs> the environmental destruction is huge. We really have had a huge impact on the planet. Um, and then at the peace level, I was very interested in looking at people on the ground. Because as a clown, you can sort of sense the energy of people when you're clowning around. You can see if people are tense or not, you know. They, if they don't like clowns, they make it pretty clear. And what I've found is that in Western culture, people are more tense. If I go to third world countries, I have less um, people with uh, clown phobias. The clown phobias typically, and there's only a few, it's not many, but they are here. And it's because of fear. People have more fear over things they can't control. So it's quite interesting on a lot of levels. I did that and then I came back to Australia and I travelled around Australia and I offered my work for free and or by donation to schools. At least 200 I contacted as I travelled and I had a tent, so I lived in a tent and I approached schools. And what I saw, I only got five responses from 200 schools for a, a peace scholar, you know, to come in and teach peace or at the very least some clowning to get kids to... Because what I'll, I'll just show you a quick demonstration. I know time is probably running out. Run out. So I can do a quick juggle. I'm just going to do a quick juggle for you because it's a good way of demonstrating balance. <coughs> See? So with with juggling, just, just walk, walk the balls up. With juggle, oh, I have to go and pick it up now. I need a third eye. <laughs> See? <laughs> so what so what juggling does is it actually balances the left and the right hemisphere. So even if I got into the schools and they're juggling, this is good because kids learn how to relax and concentrate and not to compete with anyone. Because it's a comp we think competition is great, but actually it's, it causes people to, to become better or less than others. What we want is people to actually excel, you know, to, to do better at what they're doing. You know, maybe they go under the leg, <laughs> something like that, you know. And so you're only competing against yourself and that's fine. That's, that's what I feel competition is about. So things like that can be offered in schools if they're not quite ready for peace education. We can start there with kids. Because the kids aren't concentrating. They're in the violent games all the time. And they might concentrate on the games, but they're actually losing interest in school. And they're not... A lot of the numeracy and literacy, I believe, emphasis is because kids aren't reading so much now. So they're finding the levels are dropping in school, so kids aren't comprehending things as much. And that's why I think there's an emphasis. But nonetheless, we still need to focus, I feel, predominantly on peace education. Because if you can't relate to your friend next to you, how on earth are you going to survive in the world? You know, if you can't communicate with someone, that you need to send them a text. And they do do it across the room. You know, 
So anyway, this is this is something just to consider, and I'll wrap up now. And I'll thank you all for having me here today. It's been a really great pleasure to meet you and come down to Bustleton. So thanks very much. Any questions? I don't know if we've got time. Yeah. One question. <laughs> thanks. Even the good book says, the good book says, the meat shall inherit the earth. So, you know, non-aggression, whatever. Non-aggression. Thank you very much for that. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Interested to sort of hear you talk about wanting to make change in schools, but surely fundamental change needs to happen in family at the moment. I, look, I agree, totally. And um, I mean, we've got this crazy idea that we're going to let schools sort of develop the basics in terms of the way our kids behave, when really that should be coming from home. Yeah, sure. So, so you know, what are, what are your views in, in trying to change that? I think the reality is the reason there's more on the schools, like particularly for values-based education and anti-bullying, is because it's coming from the home. In the sense that the kids aren't getting the education at home. Yeah, so, the schools so, so we need to change that, I think. Well, I, my feeling, I agree with you totally. I think the, the actual starting place for peace is in the home, definitely. But the problem is how to reach them. And I think schools are ideal for reaching the families because they are the hubs and communities. You know what I mean? It's like, where else are you going to, how do you reach in each individual family? And I would like to see not only a peace program in the schools, but let's bring in the parents to join with the children in peace activities, you know, after school, if you like. I think that's the only way you'll, only pull, you'll pull them in because the parents, they're also suffering uh, divorce. Um, many of them uh, feel despondent and unhappy in their lives, and they're not knowing how to resolve conflict either. So the kids aren't necessarily getting the good role modelling. And I'll just say one thing about males um, with children. There was uh, Stephen Badolf, who was an Australian psychologist, who stated that only 10% of boys have good relationships with their dads. That, to me, is a really important issue, yeah. that we need to rebond the families. I think they're, they're breaking up. So that's why kids are becoming a bit more wayward these days, I feel. Yeah. Just one point, one small point. <coughs> As you're getting old, I've, I've hit 80, yeah. and I reckon that, that one of the big things, they could have kindergartens alongside old, old age homes. Yeah, totally. Because yeah. kids at kindergarten, nobody, they put them there because they haven't got time for them. Yeah. The old age homes, nobody goes and visits them. And they, they, they'd be very happy to be mingling with uh, people who've got all the time in the world. I you completely know. agree with you. Um, I worked at Mirajani, which was an, an old people's home, also research analyst. And that was one of the ideas, was to bring the older people, <coughs> older people together with the young ones, because they're a beautiful mix. So yeah, I agree. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Just, a, just on a lighter note, just in, in, in light of the difference in third world countries, more open to the clowning and things, <laughs> what about the differences in their culture, like in Egypt, you being a woman, it didn't matter, you were a clown, didn't matter. Look, it didn't matter. Yeah. Look, they, they all hug, you know, and, look, I, and I forget when I'm a clown, because obviously you're not supposed to, in some cultures you can't hug if you're yeah. a female. If I'm in Afghanistan, I'll probably get shot. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, I forget. <laughs> but they embraced it because I'd look different. I don't look like a woman to yeah. men. You know, I seem like a clown funny person, <laughs> so they go with it. The only thing with Egypt is I couldn't go around the streets with the kids because um, people weren't allowed to gather in more than one or two. So there was a lot of suppression culturally. Yes, Ian? Just like um, peaceful to explain uh, her rotary relationships and particularly through the Peace University and oh, what was involved doing there. Just so the Rotarians that. know there's a rotary yeah, link. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. It's a really important point. There's a lot of the story I didn't tell you. I, I was, um, I actually went through a process where I was um, nominated to go to Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok. And it's a worldwide candidacy that, that Rotary offers. It's a three-month uh, certificate course where they bring in professionals from all over the world. Some of them are police, some of them are conflict resolvers, you know, others are lawyers. But they all have an interest in, in peacemaking or conflict resolution on some level. So I was with 19 people from um, around the world. So it was like a mini UN is what it felt like because we had a lot of input. And we had theoretical studies at, at Chulalongkorn University, and they were teachers that were brought from Bradford University, some of the peace universities from around the world that Rotary have created. They were excellent academics, I have to say, and I've seen quite a few. I was very impressed with the quality. 
We also were sent to um, conflict zones. Um, I went to uh, the north of Thailand with the group uh, to the Salween River dispute. We also met with people in Malay uh, camp, which is a 50,000 refugee camp, and I got to clown in the camp and actually meet, meet with the people. And that, I didn't even know if they'd seen clowns before, so it was an experiment. We then were sent across to Cambodia where we looked at the killing fields and we went through in great detail <coughs> what happened under Pol Pot. And then we were sent to the south of Cambodia to meet with the actual Khmer Rouge. So this was, we actually met, we met with people in disputation and it was very interesting to, to learn from them. We also um, were told about the people who were in the slums in the middle of, of Phnom Penh who were actually sent 20 kilometres out near a target factory and they were removed. They, the police came in to try and remove them. These are people that own the land there. So there was forceful removals. And there were international groups present who were trying to um, protect the local people. But in the end, they got bought out and they were, they were given some money and they were sent down 25 kilometres out of Phnom Penh near the target factory. So they ended up becoming employees of the target factory. So Rotary, I feel, provided for us a really great taste of real conflicts. With the Salween, Salween River dispute, the Salween River runs right up to China, and we went on long boats up there, and we were talking to environmentalists, we were talking to villagers, whose villages would be completely uh, wiped out through the, the da building of dams. And we also got to talk to the energy generation people and what was going on and how they were trying to influence um, the locals to leave, you know. So it was, it was I think, um, one of the best courses I've ever experienced and I, I would highly encourage you as a club to nominate peace scholars, send them across to Chula Law Point. Any, any other questions? That's just a very brief summary. It's far greater than that. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you, you thought it's not brief. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> any other questions? What did you do in your spare time, sir? I work for peace full time. <laughs> <laughs> my spare time is constantly working uh, for peace, and I'm writing my book at the moment too, to encourage others to do what I've done. Because I don't see myself as special, believe me. It's just a question of whether you want to commit to peace or not. And when you do, you sacrifice for it, and it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Just call on Eric. No. Oh, is that for Gary? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you love. Oh, he's lovely. Hey, look, um, we're all crowned, really, now, I guess. Are we? Um, yeah. Are you in, yes. I don't know what, what he was actually leading up to a little while ago when he asked you what to do in your spare time. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Sorry, I'm pretty uh, This would be the uh, most entertaining guest speakers we've had for quite a while. I've had, a, I had the pleasure over the years of thanking you for it, but this is a real pleasure. Oh, thank you. Real pleasure. Um, exactly what you were saying is what deep down we all think, you know, yeah. peace would be the way to go, how do yeah. we go about it. You, you've got out and done it, and started right. to work on it. Um, really, I think um, it was very inspirational what we've heard tonight. We'd all have to agree with that. And uh, I would like you to uh, say thank you to Karen in the usual way. Uh, and we would like, I noticed you do, don't mind a little bit of red, so what, what oh. is, we'd like to present you just with a little gift from the club. Which might help somewhere along the line. Okay. And thanks again, Karen. And, uh, oh, that's not all the time. Thank you. Thank you.